Voiceover Coffee Shop, episode number 65. Welcome to the Voiceover Coffee Shop, where we share our morning with some of the finest names in voiceover. And now, here's your host, voice actor Andrew Morrison. Hi there. My name is Andrew Morrison, and welcome to the VoiceOver Coffee Shop, where we start our day with some of the finest names in voiceover. If you'd like to get to know more about me, feel free to check out my website at www.andrewdmorrison.com. In this episode, we have the ever-fabulous Law Lapidus. Law has been a professional actor, voice talent, director, and producer for over 40 years. This force of nature is the owner of Law Lapidus Company, with hybrid online and in-person studios. She is a proud pioneer and VO talent agent artist for MCVO, a division of Model Club Incorporated in Boston, as well as one of the most intuitive and successful voiceover coaches in the industry. In this episode, we talk about creating business during recessions, accessibility and accountability, and what their importances are, and working with elite coaches. How are you doing today, Law? Oh, I'm fabulous. I love the fact that it's Friday. Mm -hmm. You know, because yeah, yeah, it's such a such Friday is an exciting day, but it's an extremely exciting day for me. I bet you don't know why. I do not know why. (laughs) <laughs> because it's the new year for me. It's Rosh Hashanah, which is one oh. of the highest Jewish holidays. And for us, it's fresh, new fall celebration. It's it's actually a new year. So so I know nothing about the Russian new year. Like, what are like the traditions of like a Russian new year? Like, how do you how do you celebrate that new year? Um, it, well, it's wonderful. I mean, it's something that I've been doing as a kid. I'm not overly religious or overly traditional, but it's one of the holidays that I've just always loved because of the the new possibilities. It's just like, you know, the American New Year that we all that I celebrate as well. It's like the new possibilities of an oncoming year. So it has that that fresh feel of coming out of summer, going into fall. And I live in New England. So in the New England states, it's even more seasonal. The the seasons are very deep and they're very specific. So the change goes from like hot to crispy cool the air changes the light shifts the the vegetation around us looks different so it really has a very different feel to it and um one That's of the cool. traditions yeah it's very cool one of the traditions andrew is to um blow a shofar so if anyone's ever seen that it's like That's a cool. ram's horn okay it's really cool it's it's just very cool it's very musical and ha- and 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 the the goal one of the goals is to you know beckon god and to and to have that long legato elongated sound just go into the universe so there is you know whether you're religious or spiritual or not at all there is that i think universal element of mm-hmm. going from the human world being mankind and people into the the spirit world if you will mm-hmm. and just kind of paying attention to that that there may be something larger than us and and deeper than us and you know at times more important than us that surrounds us but that also ignites us ignites our passion and 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 makes us um uh, incredible creatures um on the earth and I, and I love that I love that reminder so do you guys like blow that horn right at midnight is there like a ritual around it or well we do a whole service there's a whole service that leads up to it and then they blow the shofar several times and uh you know one of our treats that we'll have is apples and honey because of course the orchard oftentimes represents not only the the origins of of people but also you know the fall the harvest the fertility the oncoming of freshness and newness so we'll dip the the apple into the honey to have a sweet new year and it's just really sweet there's a sweetness there's an innocence about it that i really like you know getting back to simplicity that's really cool so yeah, how cool. You- and for voiceover yeah. talent we know when you eat an apple it mm-hmm. freshens your breath it takes right. the acid takes all the bacteria off your tongue and it clears your throat so from a vo perspective right. like have an apple <laughs> you know <laughs> So, so how do you take your coffee in the morning? How do, how do you start your day? Well, uh, that's a great question. I love the coffee. I can't mm-hmm. live without it. I'll Me neither. Coffee. I'll, <laughs> I'll try a non-dairy creamer. I love cream. I love milk. I love all of that. I'm just trying to 
keep my health in check. So I'll try a non-dairy creamer. I'll try to go with that. And I used to do sugar in my coffee all the time because I love sugar. That's like one of my vices is sugar. But just for health reasons, I try to lay off. My daughter taught me, put honey in the coffee. Put honey in the coffee. It's going to taste so much better and cleaner. And if it's a clean honey and a local pure honey, it's going to be so much healthier for you. So I love that. I have gotten used to that, just putting that honey. And sometimes I'll put um, agave in the coffee too. Okay, yeah. Which is super fun as well, just to change it up a little bit. I don't use sweeteners. I don't use, you know, um, uh, saccharins or, or sweet and low or anything like that. Um, it's got to be, you know, the more pure, the better for the coffee. So what kind of alternative creamers do you end up using? I'm, I'm an oat milk guy kind of myself. Mine is not so alternative. I hate to break it to you. It's like coffee mate. Okay. It really isn't the most alternative. I'm not a big fan of like almond milk and all of that. Uh, to me, the thinness it's really more about texture that, I think, see that's me. why i like oat because it still has like that creamy texture to it that's why yeah 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 milk. right if i were to do that then i would go for the oat based mm-hmm. if i were to do that uh and have that on hand i agree with you i think that the the thickness it can it tricks the mind into thinking you're having <laughs> the heavy stuff we used to have right. back in my day <laughs> we used to have heavy cream if you can believe that mm-hmm. like the whipped cream the mm-hmm. whipped cream the heavy cream, we used to put that in coffee. Oh, I still do sometimes. There you go. I mean, that that's to me, that's like, that's. It's weird. indulgent. It's just so rich. It's, it's a treat. Yeah, that's like, you know, you land the job of your life. You use right. <laughs> <laughs> right. So you wear like a million different hats. La Lapidus Company, MCVO, Talent Inner Circle. But you also started acting from like a really young age. So like, how did you. What what's your origin story story in this whole um, industry of of acting and voice acting and age and like well, how how did you get your start? Oh, such a great question! And you know, it's funny. I have to, like everyone else, I'm sure I have to uh, encapsulate it in something that's brief and deductive, because you know, you live 55 years. This show could go on and on for hours. So um, I don't think the listeners want that. So, <laughs> uh, you know, I'll say this: when I grew up as mm-hmm. as a child growing up, I was always in this industry. I was never not in it. So it almost was not a choice for me. It was something that was organic and innately within me. And I actually started out as a dancer. So I was- What kind of dancing? I was actually, I don't think I was ever great at it, but I was a ballet dancer as a young, young kid. I was auditioning for like the Nutcracker and ballet and all of that jazz. Loved it, but I didn't love it as much as when I found jazz- Bob Fosse style, musical theater stuff. That's the stuff I really loved. Mm. And I did that until I became an actor and found that I could speak. (laughs) And I I actually was a shy kid. I was, I wouldn't call myself an introvert, but you know, I, I, I experienced what a lot of my clients experience. And that is like, whether it's a social phobia or anxiety around speaking to strangers or getting up and talking to an audience I had that as a kid. I know what that feels like. I can really empathize with that. That's why I was a dancer. Dancers don't talk. Dancers talk with their bodies. They don't speak words. They talk with their bodies. And so learning how to translate kinesthetically from the muscles and the physical spirit, because I had no inhibitions about that at all. I would move in any way my body would allow me to move in. And, and really transferring that into myself and my mind and my intellect and engaging that as an actor was extremely seductive to me. I fell in love with that. I kept dancing until I reached my 20s. And then I sort of stopped, which I always regret, and really went full force as an actor throughout my 20s. I did everything. I did equity tours. I did um, stock. I did repertory. I did regional. I did all of that. And went to graduate school. I actually went, was accepted at UC Irvine on a full, full ride. Full yeah, tuition. you have a fine arts degree, right? I have a fine arts degree, a master mm-hmm. of fine arts in acting. I was selected in one of the top programs at UC Irvine and was well on my way to be a working talent um, in the LA market uh, and by coastally. And then I took a, I took a left turn at Albuquerque. Yeah. I started teaching and I started directing and I fell in love with it and found myself teaching in the college and university circuit when I graduated. And 
uh, then my performer took a back seat to that because I be found that I became a performer for the audience of education. And that was very fascinating to me. I had never really done that before. And I found it was very empowering being a mentor, being being somewhat of a scholar in my field. I was not a PhD in terms of being a researcher, but I was a PhD in terms of having a terminal degree, which was the Master of Fine Arts, and, and loved it and taught in the college, the top college and university circuits. I taught, ironically, business students who were coming in from all over the world and who wanted to learn the actor and vocal craft of how they talk to an audience. How do they pitch a product? How do they deliver their entrepreneurial ideas and concepts and get buy-in on that? Cool. And that, 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 that just, you know, I married that, that, that swept me away. That swept me away that all of a sudden I was thinking, wow, I guess I'm an entrepreneur. I love this way of thinking. This is so freeing. It's, it's terrifying. It's mm -hmm. scary. It's a huge risk at all times, but there's something really delightfully exciting. It's like being on a Six Flags ride all day long and not knowing if you're going to hit the ground. There's something really incredible about that thing. And so that took me through like 10 years, a decade until I opened my studio. When I was 40, I was given an offer that I couldn't refuse. And I opened my my professional studio, Lollapita's company, Mm -hmm. And 15 years later, running strong, hybrid studio. We still do in-person clients, but of course we're online with our global right. global base. And very proud of that. Very proud of the trajectory of how that all went from performer to teacher to director um, to producer. I became a producer. I loved producing to entrepreneurial business owner. And that really was the bag of tricks for me to be able to offer services to clients that were viable services that were needed in our industry and really discover how to package that, how to create that and, and fill the pain point that that was happening in the industry because I had that business background. I sort of went for a business degree without going for a business degree. Right. So is that, is that why you wanted to open up a studio so that way you could package everything in-house? Uh, no, I didn't really think in that way. I wasn't, I guess I wasn't so sophisticated to think in that way. I think I wanted to open a studio for many years because I wanted to, let's see if I can articulate it. I wanted to help and mentor and create, you know, I have a sign in my office, Andrew, I'm looking at it right now, mm -hmm. create the things you wish existed. Beautiful. And there were things I didn't have as a performer that I wish I had had. And one of the things was management an understanding of structure, business mindedness, acumen from an industry. I did not have that. I never had that. Even at the top levels of grad school, it wasn't in the studies. It just wasn't. It was performance geared. And I feel like the show business is really the business of show. Business really does come first in a lot of ways. You have to know what you're doing. You have to understand your track. You have to know what your purposes are, your goals are, and you have to be able to articulate that. So I was I was in love with that. I was enamored of all of that. And it was an endless problem to solve. And I love being a director, being a producer. It's really about solving problems every single moment of the project. And I crave that. I really, I really love that, you know. Um, and when I would act or I would do a voiceover, or I would get cast in something. To me, it was easy compared to everything your brain has to do as a director and producer. Mm -hmm. So I loved, I loved doing both. I loved being able to still be a performer and be called in by by studios and theaters to perform. But I, I always loved, I was always attracted to running things, creating things, making like making shit happen for people that, right. that just can't do it for themselves or don't know how. I know what that feels like. Like I empathize with that, you know? Mm -hmm. So I wanted to be the thing. I wanted to create the thing that I felt I didn't have and was missing for myself. 
So how did that tie into MCVO? When, when you were establishing that agency, what were you trying to create with that? So, um, so skip now, 12 years later, mm -hmm. and we're right in the height of COVID. And in the height of COVID, as most of us were locked down, we had to be even more creative. We had to say, okay, right. well, if voiceover talent, this is still good. We can build our home studios. We can work from home. There's still loads of jobs coming through. This is great. But I felt like there was something missing in our market. Now I'm a New England based business. That's where the we're outside of Boston. That's where our business is based. Mm -hmm. We had a second satellite studio in Midtown Manhattan. We also have uh, boots on the ground programming in LA. But the home for us is really Boston. And when I looked at the New England market, I said, what is, what is really missing here? What could put us on the map? And for me, it was obvious. We needed a voiceover division. We don't have any division of voiceover, geared, focused voiceover in any of the agencies in New England. And I had already been working in New York and already been working on a national scale. And I said, well, let's see if we can create something. So I went and I courted a handful of agencies and I know everyone and I'm friendly with everyone and I, I I support all everyone's businesses but no one took me up on it until I uh, pitched this to my friend and my colleague Tim Ayers who owns and operates Model Club Inc out of Boston mm -hmm. he has represented myself my daughter half of my staff as actors so he knew us he had I believe uh, a level of trust in us already as professionals to know we're the real deal. We're not just going to pitch something and then not execute it and float away. We're really, you know, serious about it. But COVID helped in the sense that we were all locked down, isolated, frustrated, and wanted to create things. If we didn't have that, would it have been created? I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe not so easily. Maybe not. So luckily I had buy-in from Tim. He said, great, I don't do that. I, I mean, I, I'll do it if it comes to me, but it's not my specialty. I don't know about it. You have to run it. You run it, you stock your roster. We'll make it a separate division. I handle the actors and models. I said, great. And then I walked away and said, all right, I don't know how to do that. How do I do that? And that's what all of us as entrepreneurs or solopreneurs have to learn how to do is again, the six flags ride, jump off the cliff. Don't be afraid of that extreme fall where you don't know what's going to happen next. And you have to save yourself because that's exactly what we do as business owners every day. We have to figure it out every day. Long story short, my staff at the studio is staff for MCVO. We all work as a tremendous well-oiled machine and we bring in tremendous clients. Tim has an amazing client list already existed for on camera that he converted to voiceover. <laughs> and then I have my own clients and producers that come in and it has been amazing. We have 400 of over the top talent from New England to New York to LA. We represent five countries now. We are a SAG signatory, union, non-union, diversity talent, non-binary. I mean, you name it, we are looking to represent and grow that base. And we're open to everything. We're a bread and butter agency, meaning we're commercially, primarily commercially based, but we've done some animation pilots. Uh, I'm producing an audio drama in the fall that will utilize video talent. So we're very much open to creativity for sure. And it just seems like all of your businesses were created when some some kind of economical downturn was happening. Yes, yes, that's and crazy. I love that you say that, honey. The Every single one, from uh, from Lollapita's company being created uh, during the the Obama recession to MCVO created during COVID to even Talent Inner Circle can technically be qualified as being created when all of this AI stuff is swooping up. Exactly so, right. So exactly right. I'm so glad you picked that up, and I call myself the flipper of the industry, because anyone who is in real estate and flips property, mm -hmm. I don't flip property, that's not what I do, but it's a right. great yeah. anecdote that they're coming into oftentimes depleted, depressed areas, terrible times, whatever, the worst of properties they see, and they see what it could be, what mm -hmm. the potential is, what the vision is, and right. then go to execute it, go to create it. I think of myself in that way. 
So when, when you execute it, how are you building these businesses to be bulletproof from future economic downturns? They're not. <clears throat> I'd be lying if I told you they are. They're not. I don't honestly, mm -hmm. I don't believe any businesses. I don't think any business <clears throat> is protected and recession proof. I think mm -hmm. that that is part of the horror and the fun of it all. It's like, why do we like horror movies? I happen to love horror movies. I love horror genre, but I'm just using this as an anecdote. Why do we like horror movies? We want to be scared to death all the time. We would be terrified of what's under the bed. We won't be able to sleep at night. We won't be able to get it out of our mind. We Anticipation. Like anticipation surprise excitement and what i'd like to think of as catharsis mm -hmm. meaning we purge ourselves of our junk whatever that junk is it could be fears worries anxiety grief loss terror whatever that we purge ourselves by witnessing this so there's so it's a spiritual event when we see something that's horrific potentially not to everyone but potentially in that mm -hmm. We learn something. There's a catharsis in learning. Oh, okay. Don't go down the street at night alone and jump in front of cars. I mean, there's a morality tale to this level of entertainment. And it's similar to growing a business. It's a morality tale for you. What do I learn every day? What do I take away? What, what mistakes do I really learn and grow from and then fix and don't do it again? Um, it's not something that you have on the full metal jacket and now I'm protected and nothing can get to me because just when you think you know your business and you know your client it shifts the tectonic plate of your business shifts like for me a major shift was COVID as it was for many I was a full scale boutique white glove in person let me get you your coffee I got you your Colombian coffee you like and yeah. let's turn on the radio and let's chit chat to online to online which of course to some degree we can still do that to some degree but it's different than physically being in a room with someone so that plate is going to shift for every business whether it's technology based or or touch point based or marketing based or uh, budget based, you got to get right. ready for the earthquakes that are going to happen and then the tremors to follow if you really want to thrive. Not now, to you, now you've got to door dash them their coffee, right? Yeah. Look. Well, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny. You know, it's funny you say that because some of my VAs, some of my team are, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in other countries in the world and I love them so much. Um, and and we joke and I'll say, oh, can you grab me a dunks? You know, I'll say, <laughs> oh, would you like it? Oh, and they laugh so hard. And I said, "Is there a Dunks near you?" And they go, "Yeah, actually, there's a Dunks within 50 miles or something." I said, "I can send you a Dunks." You know, I mean, we we try to make light of it. We try to have humor about the situation. You know, because in my perfect right. world, I'd rather have them in the room with me. Right. But that's just not the nature of the economy of business and of life any longer. And I think. Mm -hmm. The more you're able to transition, pivot, shift, and stay flexible, the more likely you are to be somewhat bulletproof to what's what the next wave is of complication and problem solving. But your heart still rests as a creative, even with all of these different changes. Always. So what, what have you done, like even say within the past month to continue to build that creative part of you and, and to kind of help to to improve as a yeah. voiceover talent yourself? I love that question. I, and I'd like to think that everything that I personally do and that my team does is creative, has a super creative element. So like, for instance, we're building this, this new um, experience called Nevo, New England voiceover. Oh. And if anyone wants to find out about it, we're at newenglandvoiceover.com. And building an event is immensely intense. But the creative element is is evident in every single choice you make and every single thing you do, whether you're booking a guest or figuring out a room or ordering food or looking at the design. It's all creative. It has a business foundation. And, you know, of course, you're going to charge and make money and bring money in. And, but the but the but the underbelly of it is how creative can you be with 
what it is, separating it in the market from other events that are in a similar space, and bringing to the client or the talent or the customer, whoever your audience is, bringing a unique, artful, and interesting experience for them. Ours is immersive. Ours is interactive. Ours is very personalized. It's like the very thing, um, Andrew, that I want to do every day in person that I don't get to all oftentimes. So this is a boots on the ground in-person event. We'll have a hybrid online element to it so that we can bring folks in from around the world. And I get my cake and to eat it too. That's super yeah. creative, right? That right. That's a creative element um, to the business itself. As a talent myself, I really did put my talent, um, personal talent on the back burner as an actor, but it resurrects. It definitely resurrects. As I had mentioned before, I'm one of the producers of a brand new audio drama, which I'm so excited about. It's fantastic. Called Menno Pop. And it is based, thank you. It is based off a, a book that was created, a pop-up book. Um, oh. By my colleagues and friends uh, from Really, Really Productions out of New York. Why can't all fun. books be pop-up books? Exactly. <laughs> right? Hello. Like, hello. Thank you for that. And uh, she's she was one of the executive producers of um, Schoolhouse Rock. Oh, Rock. Cool. And they're fantastic. And yeah. Peter Strauss is the partner. He's a professional mime. Oh, my God. So we came together. I uh, I became a producer and they said to me, what, what can we do with this? What can we do with this project? And I said, well, obviously. We need an audio book. And they're like, but this is a pop-up book. How do we do that? <laughs> like, we're making an audio drama. Oh my goodness. They ran with that ball. Hopefully it'll turn into a series, but they are yeah. just, so this is an almost all female cast with a few male roles based in this pop-up book, Menopop, about education, entertainment, and joy moving through the chapter of menopause, which okay. I think not just women, but everyone can enjoy tons of humor. It's really hilarious. The illustrations are beautiful. Um, I didn't and, even think about that. I, when you described the name, I was thinking it was about minnows, like the fish. <laughs> right. No, that's what it is. And, it, and National Menopause Day is uh, October 18th. So we're going to do oh a massive virtual ongoing educational workshop party that day long. Cool. Um, and she's going nuts. She's She's got her SAG contract in place. She's got some of the top A-list voiceover talent lined up for this, going into a recording session, That's hopefully cool. in a month or so. And I'm so pleased because not only am I a producer, but I'm one of the voices in it as well. So I'm, I'm just so honored to be asked to be in it as well so i so that performer resurrects in me at the right time in the right place but i never let it take precedence over my business and my clients they have to be first right so what is the talent inner circle what is this thing that you have recently created and manifested and into the world Tell me Thank more about you it. For asking that. So we call it Tick Talent Inner Tick. Circle. And I sat on it. Honestly, I sat on it for a long time. I'm not sure why I did that. I sat on it for almost two years. So many hats, probably. Devising. And no, no, I'll, I'll be honest with your listeners. I don't mind. I'm um, being too perfectionistic. Mm. And when you're too perfectionistic about your ideas, analysis becomes paralysis. It does. It never is enough. It never is good enough. It never is right or ready to launch. So all entrepreneurs, I think, have to be really careful of that. Mm. Like, you got to get it into the world and figure it out as you get it into the world. So mm. finally, we launched it. And it's about, I'd say, 15 months old. So it's still a baby. Um, I'm very honored. We have almost 160 members worldwide in there. It's 100% online. It's through my studio umbrella and it's a monthly membership. And uh, my, my clients, my talent were really asking for it. They were saying, you should really offer something online on an ongoing basis. So in between the coaching, in between auditions, in between gigs, I can have a community. I can have an alliance of talent that I can rely on, have as rehearsal buddies, 
accountability buddies, readers, you know, just people to hang out with and, and learn technique with. Mm -hmm. said, Ooh, this is great. I love this. So we've been tinkering with this. It's turned into a massive conservatory level saturated program where we offer about five to eight programs a week. And it's just, you know, folks will pay one time per month. It's a monthly payment. We have two tiers. We have the Golden Globe, which is our first tier where we get all the programs in there. You get a weekly calendar, which is kind of blow your socks off. It's really cool. That's I'm proud cool. of it. So they'll get everything for that. And then we've got a red carpet tier above that. And that is an accountability group, one hour of inclusive coaching a month, private coaching, extra time with our guests that come through. So we're really kind of, a, you know, applying what that talent needs at that moment in time. And there's no pressure. So they can come in, come out, come late, leave early or not show up at all. We, we record everything. And we have over a thousand hours of replay in our library. So they can just sit there instead of watching Netflix, they can pop the yeah. popcorn and watch like we get agents and managers and casting and coaches. And we have weekly classes running, bi-weekly classes and drop in guests uh, that happen. So it's it's pretty full and it's exciting. And so, you know, if you can't come, you know, once, twice a month, that's fine. I mean, it's worth the price of admission because you're going to get that stimulation with that live group. It's all live real time. Um, and then you're going to get the replay time to do on your own, whether you're in the car or walking or, you know, at work, you're going to be able to have access, full 24 seven access to replays. Really Beautiful. excited about it, growing it all the time. Okay, so really cool. let's let's go on a little journey. So, you, you said nothing is definite. Economics change everything. The world changes. Blah blah blah. But just hypothetically, five years from now, where do you, what do you imagine a day for TIC or the calendar for TIC or or this baby that you've planted into the world? What what do you what do you see that looking like? specifically for the membership no no no. for for the experience for what you've created for for this inner circle that you felt was lacking in the industry that you're now putting out what what do you see it being as like a benefit to this industry or a benefit to you or or how it helps create what what do you just imagine this thing that you've created being in five years what Ooh. do you imagine it growing to be I would love to see the studio and this umbrella is tick is under the studio umbrella. I would Absolutely. love to see, I'd love to see a baseline of 500 to a thousand members in there so that we can support, we're kind of already doing it at 15 months, but we could support absolutely full-time programming, full-time programming, which is fascinating, Andrew, because you're not, you don't keep paying out for each program. You don't pay for each guest. You don't pay for each class. Mm -hmm. It's all inclusive to the monthly membership. I love that. I love that. I love, it's like going on a vacation. I don't, have you ever been on a trip where you go to an island or something and it's an all-inclusive vacation mm -hmm. for seven days? You wear a little bracelet, you're in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's that. It's that feeling. I belong. I'm a member. I have my studio fam jam, my community's there. Um, and I've got all this set up for me. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to find it. I don't have to set it up and I don't have to pay for it separately. It's all in there. So I would like to see that grow. And when I say conservatory level program, I mean, I want the top trainers, the top representatives, the mm -hmm. top people from New York to Hollywood to Europe, to Africa, I want them in, and we already have many of them coming in. I want them in to share their wisdom, their gems, watch the folks audition, interact, think about them when they have a project for casting, be, be, you know, be accessible on email if someone needs to ask them a question. I like accessibility, and I really want to see full access to programs, accessibility, accountability, and a community grow on that large of a scale. Will we have to, you know, expand? Definitely. Will we have to offer more classes? Of course, because we like to have them small and intimate. But I'd like to see that expansion happen. And I'd like to see programs running 
every day, like morning till night. I'd love to see programs run. And it's a different, it's a different uh, model than right. other memberships that are in the market. Yeah, it's, that's like a, a year model. long voiceover conference almost. Like, that's what it is, or a conservatory program, or a graduate level mm -hmm. program, or a BFA program, whatever you want to call that. I yeah. like to have access to that online so that no matter what I'm doing, wherever I am in the world, I can always tune in, find my people, watch a replay, talk to a casting director, and learn and grow. That that That's ultimately, I think, where we want to go with this. Beautiful. And not only that, have it have it uh create such a budget coming in that we can not only create a lot of work for people see that's the other thing too that's the other end of it that the that the you know end user doesn't see and that is i get to pay all my people that come in it sounds like well yeah of course you would well that's not always true <laughs> that's actually right. not always true right mm -hmm. these are j jobs they're gigs they're contracts and People can have regular work, regular work, so that when their gigs fall out or they're dry a little bit, their teaching contracts run out, you know, and they're like, oh, this is a really dry time. Like in this economy, they've got regular work coming through this membership. So I love, again, I love giving that work out. I like being the matchmaker that finds the work and gives the work out to give a more substantial, viable, ongoing career to folks who are who are working in the industry yeah yeah so we've talked a lot about your creative life and your work life what do you enjoy outside of the booth and the studio in work i know you have two beautiful children what what other things do you enjoy what foods do you enjoy what hobbies do you have out, outside of industry stuff it's so funny. I never, I never think of myself as having a hobby. I, I, I know I spend so much time in here. Right. <laughs> you know, because my work, because our work is a lifestyle business. That's why see, I'm of mm -hmm. the generation I agree. and the mindset that the, the, the mind body health balance was also through work as mm -hmm. well. Cause a lot of my colleagues are my friends too, mm -hmm. that I socialize with as well, you know, so there's a blurred line. There isn't that work and then outside life. It's, there is. It's it's a sense of purpose. But you're but you're also yeah. a four dimensional human being. You know what I mean? And so there are yeah, yeah, other yeah. things yeah. that you enjoy. And I'm curious what those yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I love simple things like I love going out. Um, I love going to restaurants. I like going out to eat. I like entertainment because of my theatrical background. I'll always, I like to listen to live musicians. Mm -hmm. I love to go to spoken word and slam poetry. Mm -hmm. I like to watch a uh, dance and theater. Um, I like live events. I like interactive live things. I love improvisation. I love stand up comedy. Um, I just love it. <laughs> and um, on the weekends, if I have any spare time, I'll grab my husband or one of my friends and I'll say, let's go. Let's get out away from the computer, go in a car and go somewhere <laughs> and then have a nice meal and then go support the arts because I want to pay for that. I want to see it stay alive. I want to, you know, I want to be one of the ones that says, oh, she's supporting this to happen. Right. Not just watching it on TV, but really supporting it to to make it go and and make it alive. So that's something I really love. I also am very passionate about travel. I love traveling, mm -hmm. and I would rather travel than buy anything. Like any materialistic item, mean would mean nothing to me compared to taking a trip anywhere, even another state in the United States, going to California or Florida or Texas. I just we were at Texas for the conference. I just love travel. I I eat it up and I feel like the shift, the balance, the healthful balance of mindset and your body and movement and you're engaging with new people and socialization is just so wonderful. Wonderful. And, and a lot of your different um, sayings that you use within sentence are, are uh, in sentences are centered around food. Like what is the most memorable meal that you've had in the last year? Most memorable meal mm -hmm. I've had in the last year. I have to think about where I've been. Um, I went to a restaurant actually not long ago when a dear friend of mine from New York was visiting me just last month, actually. Mm -hmm. And it was local to Boston where I live. <clears throat> and it was this 
Caribbean island fresh uh, fusion. I think it was called Orchid Fusion 7. Okay. And I was just surprised by it. I was engaged. I was surprised. It was fresh. It had a kick that I wasn't used to. I think that the cooks, the chefs um, came from all over the world. So you had this different spices that I wasn't used to and I wasn't expecting but it was so fresh and so beautiful the way it was displayed and it's at those moments you sit there and you go why am I why am I not eating this way day and night right (laughs) (laughs) what am I eating (laughs) you know that you realize oh my goodness this is good this is quality this is beautiful this is aesthetic and it just brings that added layer to things not just to taste good or you know you know, I crave it, but really it's presented in a way that is unique and unexpected. Right. That's cool. That is cool. That's cool. So, so if you were to write yourself a letter bef- right before you founded the Lollapitas company, if you were going to tell yourself, your past self, anything, what would you tell yourself? Um, would I know what's about to come up or no? No. Wait, yes, yes. Would I know what's, what it, what's about to happen? From where you're sitting right now, you can send a letter to yourself right before you're about to start the Lollapitas company. Okay. So you know everything you best know Best quote right? ever. I would start with the best quote, one of the best quotes ever, Eleanor okay. Roosevelt. Never, 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 never give up. I would start with that. Okay. Now, my nature is very tenacious anyway. So my nature is like that anteater. You know, the anteater was the mascot of my graduate program. And it took me a while to figure out why the anteater till I asked the program. And they said, oh, because the anteater is one of those animals that fights to the death. Hard. Okay. And they had they had a big athletic program. So I'm sure there was a competitive element to that. But that I took that to the core. I I was not... I was not offended by that. Like I didn't find it too raw or too grotesque. I I loved it because I said, oh my goodness, I'm an actor. Oh yeah, I'm an artist. Oh yeah, I'm in the hardest profession one could choose. So I would be ready to act like that anteater. You know, so starting the business, if I wrote a letter, I'd put down some Eleanor just to remind myself, no matter how hard it is, never, 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 never give up, right? and keep going, keep going, keep going. Um, And then any number of things like just, which is what I'd like to say I tried to do, just, you know, no matter how you feel and no matter what's happening in your day, treat people well. Treat people better than you think they should be or deserve to be treated. Um, not just for business sake, not just because you don't want to burn a bridge or you want to come back to them, but mm-hmm. because you don't know right. what they are going through. And you don't know. It's just like an actor. In the moments before, we talk about this with voiceover training. What happened before that script started? What are the pre-life moments? Mm-hmm. Ooh, why? Ooh, that's interesting. Well, same with a person and people you're dealing with in business. You have no idea what they just came from before they came into the scene with you and you have no idea where they're going to and what their conflicts and troubles and obstacles really are. So just give them the benefit of the doubt. Always give people the benefit of the doubt. Nine times out of 10, they will come back to you and they will really appreciate it and reward you for doing that. Oftentimes with a lifelong relationship, you know, by doing that. And I think of some of my best friends now, and I think back on what I thought of them when I first saw them, like my first impression of them, you know, and I, and I, and I think like, it wasn't, it wasn't so impressive. It wasn't so like engaging. It wasn't so, it was just give everyone that benefit that there is so much. I like to see it as Narnia's door, the closet. What's at the end of that closet? You don't know until you go and open it up. What is their world like? So go and open it up. Don't be so rash and fast that you don't have time to really get to know who they are. Know their story. Know where they're coming in from. Know where they're going. And that's how you're going to be a happier person, a better quality person, 
And a better quality, you know, talent or producer or business owner is to take that little bit of time and make people feel like you care and you matter. You know, you're not just a number, you're not just another something. Beautiful. Yeah, that's what well, I would say. Well, where can people find you and the Lollapitas company and, and all and the talent inner circle and all of these beautiful things you've made? Oh, easy, easy, easy. And I and shameless plug, I also take submissions. So if anyone is in seeking representation, I would love to receive demos for that. And that can go to Lollapitas Company at Gmail dot com and just give me a subject line you know love you law or mcvo review or something like <laughs> that um and they can also go to new england voiceover.com that's our event site for mm -hmm. nevo and our showcase that's a part of that that's our auditions that we run during nevo um and that's where they're going to find everything so lollapitascompany.com is our mother website new england voiceover.com is our event website they can email us someone will always get back to them um, and they can Zoom with us. They can jump on Zoom like we're doing now and just say, yes. hey, this is who I am. This is what I want, you know, because we want to hear people's stories. We want to know how we can be helpful to them and connect them to the next level of their career. That's what we love. Well, this has been magic. Thank you so much for coming on. This has been a oh, blast. My pleasure. You're a doll. Appreciate you. I really hope you enjoyed this incredibly insightful peek into the mind of one of the country's most incredible businesswomen and casting directors. If you want to check out her work or submit to be on the Lollapitas Company roster, you can visit her at lollapitascompany.com. Thank you for stopping by, and I'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to The VoiceOver Coffee Shop. For more information on guests, new episodes, and more, be sure to visit www.vocoffeeshop.com.